Oh my goodness. Oh my. Oh man. Man. Oh man. Cut it off, bro. No, let, let it run. Let it run, man. Let that, I'm going to tell you a story about this, man. Yeah. I, know, I ain't going to say nothing bad about nobody. I, know it's like, I ain't going to do the Jesse Jackson. Like, Right. <laughs> well, what I'm going to do to Barack Obama, I ain't going to do that, man. Oh, man. Look how that worked, bro. Come on, man. Oh, man. I'm just, I can't take it, bro. I can't take it. I can't take it. I can't take it. Oh, man. Mm, mm, mm. That's, ooh. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a funny story about this, man. Mm. Cynthia, I see you. Tell you off I see you. That's my wife. That's my, my little rock there. Never could have made it. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, man. You see how that worked? Wait, my hand. That's nice. Man, that's crazy. Mm. Mm. Hey, this this mm. one be good, man. I'm actually I'm actually sharing it now, so it worked out good. What, what we did, the way you did that, it worked because I poured it to my page. I'm actually sharing it now in the groups, so that worked out good. You know, you, you, that time, that time, <laughs> you, did, you did good that time. How you doing, Cynthia? Oh, no, that's Cynthia, Cynthia. That's my old supervisor, Cynthia. Mm. That's what's up. And my niece, Kiara. Hey. Hey, man, I'll just, ah. Uh, see, every time I come on here, I just, man. Woo. Yep. Yep. Hey, you created a monster. They don't even know. They don't even know. Oh, man. Come on. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, man. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> oh my goodness. Look at this. <laughs> Tell you what it mm -hmm. is, man. When I look back, man, uh, no doubt. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no doubt. That's awesome. Woo. Man. Mm -mm -mm. What? Mm. You got one right here. Two right here. <laughs> <laughs> Me 
being red. <laughs> I got red. <laughs> red. <laughs> I got red. <laughs> I got Reverend Wiggles on me. <laughs> See, I'm already uh, enjoying myself. Every time I come on, every Thursday from 8 to 9, this is just a, a huge blessing. Uh, when I was on my way over to the studio today, because as I drive over, I'm always thinking about what I'm going to talk about on the show. So I had a couple of things I definitely wanted to talk about. Um, first thing is um, the calling number is 678-381-1973. 678-381-1973 and you can definitely call in because it's uh, it's the type of show where we keep everything very clean, keep it very positive and it's just a lot of stuff that's been going on where a lot of people have been being blessed I've been looking at you know the different posts it's that time of year where you know kids are graduating at every level uh, so my, went to my grandson's graduation this morning he was six and um, last weekend, a weekend before last, had the honor of seeing my, my youngest daughter get her degree from Howard University. She's uh, 23. And that just really just kind of brought everything full circle. And every, you know, I got nieces and friends and uh, Patrick, I mean, you better, you know, congratulations to you all. Little Patrick is graduating. I saw his, his pictures and he was on his way to the prom and, it's just a, a very positive time of year when you can see all of these people going to just another level in their life. So kudos to everyone that's listening to the radio show and everybody that's on Facebook Live. It, it's just a, a very, very good time for things to be happening. So I'm, I've been gone for the last two weeks. Uh, one week went to, like I said, my daughter's graduation. Another week I had to do something for my nine and five, as I call it, and really wanted to do that with excellence. So God blessed me, put the words in my mouth because I definitely couldn't have did it um, myself. Uh, and I just said what he gave me to say and use those words and it, it worked out really well. Um, the presentation it was a project that I've been working on for 13 months and it was the culmination of that project. So. It really had an impact on the radio show because a lot of things that I wanted to do with the show, I had really had been holding back on it because I had been spending a lot of time and energy in that space. But now that that's over, I'm in a whole other space. I'm in a whole other space. Me and my wife are experiencing something that's totally different for us, which is uh, empty nesters. So I, I've heard people talk about that for years about you know being an empty nester and what it means and you know, how it comes, but the thing that I would say is it's the biggest thing that I, I take from it is real quiet. I appreciate that quietness. I, I 
love my grandkids. I love my kids to no end. But it's not like waking up. Well, not even waking up. It's not like going to sleep and it's peaceful. You don't hear no noise. You don't hear no, you don't hear nothing. It's, it's nice going to sleep peaceful. It's even better when you wake up and it's just, excuse me, peaceful. Just peaceful. So it's just a different type of living. So, um, that I'm, and I'm appreciative from the fact that God has blessed us with that. I mean, he blessed us with time and he's given us energy, he's kept us, you know, relatively healthy. So we can enjoy this time and this season that we're going into. So that empty nester thing is um, is real. I like it. I'm having a ball. My wife is having a ball as well. So we're trying to figure out what, you know, where we're going. Everything is all, one thing about empty nest is all about where we're going. Where we're going? Where we're going? Where we're going? Where we going? So it's just, um, and it's a good thing because now I'm starting, you know, I kind of look at the universe paying us back for all the years that we've, you know, raised our kids. We had our kids very young. And uh, when you have your kids young, you, you do have a certain amount of responsibility that goes with that. And we've done an exceptional job. My wife is on the air, Tanya, and there was no way I could do it without her because anybody that knows that has a successful marriage and it can raise a successful family, the only thing you have to do is look at the fruit. I mean, it talks about that in the Bible a lot. Um, and it talks about that when you're just talking to people in general. So, you know, when I look at my three kids and what they're doing and then I look at my grandkids, that's the fruit of what me and my wife was talking about, thinking about, joking about, playing about that came and it manifested in our life. So that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is just some of the decisions that we make in our lives sometimes become generational decisions or have generational impacts on things. And I have a couple of examples about that. One thing I want to share with the listening audience is that song never would have made it. This past Sunday, it's, it's a funny story, but it's, it's true. In life, <clears throat> the thing that I wanted to encourage you all with is in life, many times we want to do different things and we, it's not that we're fearful, but sometimes we, we second guess ourselves because the only person that's really stopping us from doing different things is, is really just us. It's really no such thing as fear, really no such thing as anything that's limited because with God, everything is limitless. So most of the times it's just us being in the way. So what we do is we look for these different signs and confirmations and things of that nature. So I'm no different. And as I've been doing the radio show, I'm, all, I'm constantly thinking about, like, hey, you know, it's, this is going great. I, I always joke about this is like show number maybe 10, and I got about 1,000 shows to do. So that way I know I'm working on something great. Um, all this stuff that has already come out of the show has been tremendous. The weeks that I was off, people were texting me like, hey, man, you ain't going to be on the air this week. I ain't. So, hey, it's going to be recorded. So I've been getting a lot of positive feedback. But it's, this this is just the beginning. This this is in its infancy. And so um, last Sunday, I went to church. This was a funny story. Went to church, and it was raining. So a lot of people, for whatever reason, didn't come to church, or it was you know less people than normal. So me and my wife got to go and sit all the way up front. So the usher takes us all the way down front, down front, and minister comes up. He, you know, our bishop, Bishop Dale C. Brown at Word of Faith Family Worship Cathedral. He came up and, you know, he did his opening remarks and said, okay, now we're going to go into the offering. But when they went into the offering, they started singing the song. Because, you know, doing the offering, they always going to sing the song. What song did they start singing? Hmm. They had this brother come up there. They played the first few keys. I said, oh, no. So I'm like, oh, y'all got to let me out here, right? So I <laughs> Man, I heard that song. That brother was up there. I'm like, never would have made it. Man, I done jumped out. I'm trying to get out, but it's doing the offering. So the brother's like, I'm trying to get out past these people so I can get out and get, I want to go up to, I'm going to the altar at this point because I'm like, I'm losing it. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So the brother's like, nah, man, you gotta, you gotta wait, you gotta wait. It's doing the offering, it's doing the offering. So I'm like, what? I'm like, wait, I can't wait. This is my song, man. This is my, you don't listen to the show. That's my theme song. This is my. So I had to wait a couple minutes, and then he gave me the green light, and um, 
I went out there, you know, we got a pretty nice size church, but I wasn't even, I wasn't thinking about who was looking, listening, whatever. I had to go out there. And I wasn't, you know, I had my suit and everything. I had on my jeans, it was raining. But I had to go out there and just thank God for sending me that direct confirmation that what I'm doing, I'm on the right track. And I just went out there and, and just said a prayer. Just stood right in the center of the altar, right in the middle of the church to say, you know, hey, I'm here. I know you focused on me. I know I'm doing the right thing. And just had a moment. And then when I came back, the brother was, you know, he grabbed me and he was, he said, man, I'm sorry. He saw the party. He said, man, I thought, you know, we was doing all. He said, I thought you was going to the bathroom. I didn't know you was going to the altar, man. I'm, I was like, it ain't no problem. It's all good. But that was just, you know, one of those moments where I was saying, okay, we get some, uh, some confirmation in there. Um, again, if you have any questions or if you want to call in with a comment, the direct number to the radio show is 678-381-1973. 678-381-1973. And like I always do, every week that I come on this show, every show that I do, I'm going to always bring you some literature because one of the things that we talked about on the show is that you know millionaires and people that are super successful they say on average they read about five books a month that's about 60 books a year um, the average adult reads about one book a year and most times that's something that's fictional like a romantic novel or something to that you know effect so Every time I've, I've committed, I started doing it when, when I first came on the show. Like every week before I come, I always, you know, go into my library, pull out a book. And something that I think is going to be impactful that people really need to know about. So last week, well, the last time I was on the air live, which was three weeks ago, the book was entitled The Law of Success. And The Law of Success was a book that was written by Napoleon Hill. And this book was written back in the early 1900s, uh, like 1908, 19, somewhere between 1908 and 1915, somewhere up in that era. So right at the turn of the century, prior to the Great Depression, but in the law of success, what Napoleon Hill was doing was he was charged with going around and studying successful men of his day. So he got to interview Andrew Carnegie, which the namesake for like Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Mellon University, this was the richest man in the world at that time. Um, he got an opportunity to interview Henry Ford, study Henry Ford, Wrigley from uh, Wrigley Gum, Wrigley Field, you know, he, and he, you know, Firestone, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller. He got to interview all of these people, and he just distilled all this information about what it takes to be successful. Now, the funny thing about that book, he wrote that book. And a lot of people went on to use it in motivational speaking, positive you know, thinking, things of that nature. But the problem was this. Even though he wrote the book, even though he did the research, he, had, he struggled with fear. Now, we talk about that on this show. Now, I'm going to show you how deep this is. This man wrote, he, now he studied, it took him 20 years to study all of these people. To get a PhD, you can get a PhD in any subject in between four and seven years. This man studied this topic for 20 years and then wrote a book on it. So he was the expert on success. He was the expert on what it takes. And he was getting it directly from people that were the most successful people of his day. But even with all of that information, even with knowing exactly what to do, he couldn't do it himself because of fear and the fear that gripped him. So what happened was he got into a point where he was in poverty. He was destitute. He couldn't generate income and he was struggling. Where well, you would think that somebody that had all of that information would be able to sell it, talk about it, be confident, but that wasn't him. What it gripped him was fear. So what he ended up doing was, because he was an author, now this is a deep book, because he was an author, what he ended up doing was writing another book that came directly behind The Law of Success. Same author. 
So Napoleon Hill wrote a book, and the book is called, and you can you know, hopefully, because I tell you all all the time, make sure that you, when you come to the show, have something to write with, because we're going to talk about some deep stuff. This book is called Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. This is a, what I call a light book. Like I, I told you before, we have some books that you just read, pick them up, use them as a reference. This book, this book, I'm going to tell you how deep this book is. This book is probably the second best book that I've ever read because of the way that it's tied to how deep, how deep it is to the way that the world works. And I'll give you, I'm going to just share a little bit about you know this book now Napoleon Hill on the first page he says fear is the tool of a man-made devil self-confident faith in oneself is both the man-made weapon which defeats the devil and the man-made tool which builds a triumphant life and it is more than that it is a link to the irresistible forces of the universe which stand behind a man who does not believe in failure and defeat as being anything but temporary experiences. Now, the deep part about this book is this. He wrote the book, say 19, the, the original copy came out, I wanna say it was like 1915. And when the book came out, his wife told him that she feared for him to publish the book because of the recourse of what people were gonna think. This book is written where he's having an interview with the devil. This is the only book that I've ever read that is a complete, this is a complete Q&A. This is not a narrative. This man is going through here where he's asking questions. And this, here's the paradox. He's asking questions, specific questions in the book that he said he's He's asking these questions of the devil. So he's interviewing the devil. And he's asking questions of the devil, like why, why does, you know, why do people struggle? Why what is fear? Um, how do you break up marriages? How do you how do you instill fear in children? How do you get so much uh, fear in the people that go to church that should be believers? This is this is Q and A. Now for people out there that have read a lot of books, this is the only, like I said, this is the only book I've ever read. And it's maybe like three, no, 250 pages of Q&A. So the question becomes, when you read the book, when I first read it, I turned maybe like two of my friends on and they turned on 10 and they turned on 10 because everybody wants to know, how did he do that? Did he really interview some type of spirit? Did he have some type of divine intervention where he was allowed to express this? Was this in his mind? But whatever it is, and he tells you at the end of the book, he said, whatever you think it is, that's what happened. But when you read the content, and I'm going to just share one little quick thing with you about one of the questions and one of the answers. The question is, it says, go ahead and tell me more of the methods by which you cause people to drift to hell with you. Mm -hmm. This is now. This is a question. Now here's the answer to the question. I cause people to drift on every subject through which I can control independent thought and action. Take the subject of health, for example. I cause, and now this. Keep in mind, this is in 1900. This is like 1915. I cause most people to eat too much food and the wrong sort of food. This leads to indigestion and destroys the power of accurate thought. Mm. If the public schools and the churches taught children more about proper eating, they would do my cause irre irreparable damage, irreparable damage. Now that was on health. Next topic, marriage. I cause men and women to drift into marriage without plan or purpose designed to convert the relationship into harmony. Here is one of my most effective methods of converting people into the habit of drifting. I cause married people to bicker and nag one another over money matters. Mm -hmm. I cause them to quarrel 
over the bringing up of their children. I engage them in unpleasant controversies over their intimate relationships and in disagreements over friends and social activities. I keep them so busy finding fault with one another that they never have time to do anything else long enough to break the habit of drifting. Mm. That's deep. That's deep. Now listen to this on Dominic Thoughts. No, listen to this because this is a personal finance show. Listen to the same question because he's asking another, go ahead and tell me more of the methods by which you cause people to drift to hell with you. And one of the topics is savings. Savings. Listen to this. I cause people to spend freely and to save sparingly or not at all until I take complete control of them through their fear of poverty. That's deep. Dominating thoughts. I cause people to drift into the habit of thinking negative thoughts. This leads to negative acts and involves people in controversies and fills their minds with fears, thus paving the way for me to enter and control their minds. When I move in, I do so by appealing to people through negative thoughts, which they believe to be their own. I plant the seeds of negative thought in their minds of people through the pulpit, the newspapers, the moving pictures, the radio, and all other popular methods of appeal to the mind. I cause people to allow me to do their thinking for them because they are too lazy and too indifferent to think for themselves. Mm. Now, the deepest part about this book is this, and it's right on the front cover. It says right here, this book was hidden from 1938 until 2011. This man's wife had to pass away. Her children, all of her children passed until her last surviving child was living. The Napoleon Hill Foundation gave this young lady, Sharon Lecter, they gave her the authority or the rights to publish the book in 2011, and the book was written in 19, I want to say 1915 or somewhere in there, but if, trust me, pick this book up, get a copy, read it, it would do It would do your world of good. Um, I see my nephew join, I see Dank, Mark Watts is joined, Andre Parker, shout out to um, all the family and friends. Um, the radio, the, the number to the radio station, 678 381-1973. If you have a question or comment, if you want to call in, uh, and everything that I'm doing tonight is really going to tie back into this. Outwitting the devil, and outwitting the devil is real, because what you got to do, and this is what we talk about on the show, you got to get to the point where you can control your mind, and you're not letting some external force control you on things that you know you need to be doing. So if it's working out, eating right, saving money, paying bills off, because you know when you are in poverty or you know when you're having bill issues, that permeates everything in your life. It, it, it permeates your marriage, your relationships with your children, relationship with friends. It, it, it wears on you, you know, your self-esteem, your self-worth, you know, things that you think you can do, your creativity. Because when you bound by debt, it's really being in bondage and you letting somebody else dictate to you what you can and can't do. So what we're trying to do on this show is make sure we give you some tactics, give you some real life examples about things that you can do to change your situation. Now, one of the things, and I told my producer, I said we was going to wait. So right now we're at the bottom of the hour. It's 830. So what I want to do for you now is um, I'm going to have him replay my new intro that was done by one of my best friends in the world, me and this guy. We grew up together, we call each other cousins. So he's, he's really like my brother. I met him when I was four years old and um, he's really talented. And when he first heard the show, he was like, this was back in February. He said, man, I'm gonna do, I, I wanna, you know, would it be okay if I did you a, a intro or a jingle? Or I said, man, you, you the only guy that I allow to call me on my birthday and be serenading me because I don't do no, <laughs> but this is my cousin. He, he, the dude is talented, he can sing, but every birthday I look forward to getting that, that voicemail where he's singing. <laughs> he's singing, but that's it. Ain't no other dudes going to be singing to me, so. But that's cuz, but um, he did a phenomenal job on this jingle. We're going we gonna to do a little tweaking, we're going to put it into a loop. But uh, I want you all to hear this, because when I first came on, 
I know people were just getting onto the show, and I was like, hey, but I want to share this with you all. So I'm gonna have my uh, have my producer to go ahead and go ahead and hit that jingle for. Her. Man, check that out. Check that out. Oh, you can't hear it? They said they can't hear it. Hey, yeah. DJ, what's your phone? You need to put it over to the microphone? No, they shouldn't let it hear. Alright, we're gonna try to do it again. I don't know what. Cut it out, man. You got my you got my one more time. Oh, here we go. See, you got my one more time. We got the jingle now, we can't we got the bowl system in here. And they said they can't hear it, man. I don't understand why they can't hear that shit. Is it because you got this thing part now? Mm -hmm. Alright, go on and play it again. I'll put I'll put the mic up to the speaker. I'm getting that today. Using what? Alright, but we'll we'll re we'll re cue it up. Can you hear That's uh, that's 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 uh, Big D. Um, that's his nickname, Brian Stewart, my friend for life. So, but um, I was so excited when I got that. I was like, wow, I, that just shows you like where we headed, what we're doing, and, and how many people are, are like really pulling for you. So I know we talk about that a lot, but um, it, excellent. So the where the you know where the show is going and what we're doing. That was just, again, another confirmation, like, hey, mm -hmm. that just came out of somebody's idea, and now it's, it's here to support us and support me in the show, and I'm really appreciative for it. So if you have any questions, any comments, if you want to call into the show, 678-381-1973. We had touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to talk, this was on my list of topics for tonight. I wanted to talk about personal finance, but I really wanted to talk some more about mindset, because... When I teach seminars on personal finance and we talk about managing money and eliminating debt, creating savings and, and doing some investing, it really starts with your mindset. And the, the thing about your mindset, one of one of the things that I always like to, you know, encourage people to do is, is get to a point where you can not only you can think clearly, but you can have what's what I call a resilient mindset and a resilient mindset is getting rid of all of that negativity that you beat yourself up about about things that happened in the past or things that you think you're not whatever you fill in the blank I'm not whatever but getting all of that out of the way and then like this book talks about out with the devil the main tool or tactic that the devil uses against people is is distraction. So once you start doing something and once you start, you know, committing to things, things are going to come up. An argument is going to come up. Uh, somebody's going to say something to offend you. It's going to come up. Something's going to happen, you know, with your friends. Something's going to happen at work. But all of those are just distractions. So if you can start off your day and end your night with a positive mindset and thinking through things, whereas when you go out, you say, Basically, I don't really care what happens today, how it happens. As long as it's not fatal or it's not something that's going to be catastrophic, 
then you got to be able to, you know, have a thick skin and, and just shrug it off. Or do what, you know, one of my friends um, said, which is to compartmentalize, compartmentalize things. That's where you just put them into a little box, put the lid on it, but you don't let it just, just tear you up or you don't carry it with you. You don't just, you know, let that replay in your mind over and over and over. They said, I was too, whatever, I'm, I'm not smart enough. But when you change your mindset and you start doing little simple things, it has nothing to do with money initially, but it has everything to do with money later on. Because once you change your mindset, even if you have a lot of debt, even if you try to get something off your plate from a, a bonded standpoint, once you change your mindset, then you start to appreciate more of the things that you already have. Because most people, when you talk to them, they always talk, they start off talking about the things that they don't have. I, got, I wish I had this or I only have or I, I just have. So they minimize things as opposed to saying, you know what, I'm full of life. I got my health, wealth. Everybody in my family is healthy. And don't even talk about the debt because it ain't, ain't nothing to talk about. Because every time that you talk to things that are negative, you give energy to it. So what you want to do is you want to be counterintuitive. And like this book was talking about, it, Outwit the Devil, take your mind back. Take your, it don't matter how much whatever you're going through, if you can control this, you can get your mind back and, and, and really create a fortress, create something that's impenetrable with your mind, then you could do anything. People don't know, when they look at me, that they don't know if I'm broke, they don't know if I got money. It looked like I got some money, but that could just be my appearance. So, you know, you carry that type of spirit with you in your mindset, so that way when you go into... Okay, we're going to get into some debt elimination. And when you start wanting to have those conversations with your spouse or the kids or whatever, like, hey, we cut the cable off. And they gonna, everybody going to rant and rave about, oh, I'm going to miss Game of Thrones. I'm going to miss Empire. I'm going to miss such and such. I ain't going to just, hey, this is going to be good. It, it's going to be a hard pill to swallow. But trust me, it's going to benefit everybody later on. And I'm not telling you anything that I haven't done. Another thing that I was going to tell you all, this is a little tip little tidbit um, that you can definitely do if you're an empty nester or if you got an extra bedroom. It's pretty, it's pretty, I guess you would say dramatic, but at the same time, it is very, very, very effective. Years ago when I used to have a lot of, like we would have a lot of bills, a lot of different things, what we did was we used to go to the um, school supply store where all the teachers go and get their supplies. We used to go to a school supply store, buy a bulletin board paper, big it's like two maybe two or three feet high the height you know like bullet like old school like bulletin boards and then we would get a roll of it and we would roll the bulletin board paper in our bedroom from one corner of the wall to the other one and then take a marker and create months like the whole thing and then take all of our all of our bills and list them on this big huge bulletin board in our bedroom every bill that we had and we would have it listed out for every month. And at the bottom of the bill, at the bottom of the paper, what we would do is we would mark when we would want to be, you know, this certain bill would be paid off and how much we needed to pay to get to the point where we paid it off. And we did that for a number of years. We was, the first time we did it, we was trying to buy a house. We was living in an apartment. So the first time we did it, we did it in an apartment. And I remember my, my father-in-law came, you know, God bless his soul. That was uh, Leon Towns. And then when he came, he, he slept in our bedroom. And when he came out for breakfast, he was like, man, there's a lot of stuff back there. <laughs> I was like, what kind of stuff? The room is clean. He said, no, I mean up on that wall, man. What's all that? <laughs> he was like, what's all that stuff? So it was just a, a technique that we developed over the years. And then I took it a step further. If you go to Home Depot, Home Depot has some paint that you could paint the walls. And I got this idea from a, a business that I went to. Uh, this company started a business, and what they did was they took all of their walls inside, all of their in, internal walls, and they made them out of dry erase material. So, and the, and the theory behind it was the owner of the business, very successful man, he said he didn't want his employees to be walking down the hall and have an idea and don't have a piece of paper or how to write it down because sometimes and we've done that 
sometimes an idea come to you like split second, then when you go back and try to remember it, you'll have a, a different thought. So we got a caller calling in. Uh, so we're gonna take a call right now. Caller, you on the air with Joaquin and the Daily Bread Radio Show. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, Joaquin. I'm, um, my name is Tanya. I'm calling from the Atlanta area. I have a question on on self improvement. Okay. Okay. What are some of the ways can one invest in themselves? I mean, do you have any ideas? Or I know you talked about books that you should read. Now I got a collection of those. But what are some of the tapes, seminars, and how can one single mindedly concentrate on the self to improve? Okay, self improvement. So I'm writing that down because I got a couple different thoughts about that. So, one of my first ones that I would I would recommend is reading the Bible. Right, get a section of the Bible that you feel comfortable with reading, and sometimes not just the King James version, because sometimes the King James version can be a little little difficult to understand. I would say get like a New Living version of the Bible, um, or something that's not so much you know old English, so you can understand what they're saying. And pick a section out and read that every day. Like every day, just read. It could be the same book every day. It could be Ecclesiastes. Like for me, I do Proverbs. Like every day, I read a proverb that corresponds with that day. And what that's going to do is, no matter what's going on with you in your mind, just being in the presence of the Word is going to help you counterbalance that. The second thing I would say is you really have to get to a point when you start talking about self-improvement. The second thing I would say is you, you really have to get to a point where you, you forgive yourself and you forgive everybody else. And what I mean by that is many times when you think about God and Jesus, one of the biggest things, that the biggest miracle was this, is to have somebody do you wrong or treat you a certain way or say something that, you know, offends you and you hold that and you take that with you and every time you see them, you replay it and you go back to where it was. But if you get to a point where you say, you know what, yeah, you did, you, you, you really like, you know, hurt me or you really did this to me and I understand it. But if you can say, you know what, I'm good and let that person go by and forgive yourself of all the missteps that you've done in your own past, that would be the second thing I would say. It's like, so the first thing would be read the Bible, get you a section of the Bible, you read it daily. The second thing would be, you know, get into a forgiveness mode. Because most people, what they do is they tell you, like, hey, no, what, you shouldn't forgive him or forgive her. Or, you, know, you need to, you know, retaliate, what have you. But if you read the Bible, all these people was doing this stuff to Jesus, and he knew they were going to do it to him. And he's still treated him right. And at the same time, excuse me, if you think about how blessed we are as a people and all of the stuff that we fall short on, we say we go to church and then the day before we go to church, we at the club, we drinking Hennessy, we doing all this, we having all these crazy thoughts. And then we turn right back around and what God say, I still love you. I'll still take you in. You can still have salvation. So, you know, getting into that type of spirit uh, would be the second thing. The third thing I would say is you really got to get serious if you want to do self-improvement. So you've seen people on weight plans. You see people on, you may say they want to change their finances, but you got to envision that. You got to see it in your mind and say, you know, I want to lose a certain, oh, I see me in a certain place. A lot of times people, you know, create things like vision boards or they'll cut out pictures so that way you can imprint and envision something in your mind and if once you envision it in your mind what happens is when you marinate on that you go to sleep on it you wake up on it your subconscious will start to act on that because the subconscious doesn't know if something is positive or negative it just knows what keeps replaying and ruminating in your mind that's why many times when you have dreams about different things you dream about a lot of stuff that you're stressing about like you were stressing about you know, oh, I think my son is selling drugs or whatever. And that'll be on your mind. He ain't come home or she out. When you go to sleep, you have a dream about it. I dreamed about such and such and such. So if you reverse that and start thinking about 
positive things, things that you want to come to pass, what will happen is when you go to sleep, your mind, your subconscious mind will start to take control of that and start bringing positive images into your life. So you got to visualize where you are. And once you visualize where you are, you got to stick to it. That's the other thing I was thinking about on my way over here today, even with me. Started this in February. Here it is. This is May. So I've been doing this for about four months now. And it's kind of like when we was in, in middle school. You know, that used to be a big thing when I was in like middle school and elementary school. It's like, we celebrate our anniversary. We've been going together for four months. <laughs> you know, that was a that was a big thing, but it's it's real. Because if you think about it, no, I know that you wanna laugh, but that's you remember back in junior high, he's like, man, we've been going together for four months. Like, I said, like, what did you celebrate? He celebrated that anniversary. <laughs> I said, shit. <laughs> I said, this, this is a family show. I'm like, you man, go. <laughs> like, man, go on with that. But anyway, um, but the, the, the thing about that is, it's some truth in it because think about the things that you commit to and you hold them in front of you for four months, your whole world can change. And what I talked about earlier about that one person, that one person changed the thing. And I'm, and I'm gonna give you a quick story. It's a brother, he got on Facebook, good friend of mine. I'm gonna go on and shout him out. I mean, when I say good friend, he's a really good friend of mine. His name is Dwayne Terry. And I was thinking about him today, and I was thinking about me at the same time. But here, I'm gonna give you the short version. Dwayne Terry grew up with me me and Dwayne Terry went to the same middle school. But when Dwayne Terry got to the point where he was getting ready to go to high school, his mother made a key decision. She said, he's not going to rain, he's not going to Reebok, he's going to go to Bowles. Now, for people that live in Jacksonville, they understand, because my nephew is on here, Andre. Now, me and this brother, we grew up together all the way through so he was Sherwood, Harborview, the whole night. He lived right there off the Lamb Turner, right when you come around. It used to be a Kmart and a movie theater right there on the corner. So his mother made one decision. She said, you're not going to go to Wayne's. You're not going to go to Reebok. You're going to go to Bowles. Fast forward. Graduate from Duke. Go to Duke Law. Now his son, now you go into the future. Now, this is way before his son came on the scene. So his, his mother made this one decision. He graduates, starts working, starts his family, starts having kids. Now, his son is getting ready to go to college. His son is going to Dartmouth. The thing I put out to you is this. How many people do we know in our circles that we run in that the parent and the child went to Ivy League institution? That's just setting, that's just setting the next generation up even higher. Not to the fact that it's Ivy League, but I thought about myself too. My youngest daughter, I went to Howard. When I went to Howard, I went thinking about, okay, my daughters, my kids, my. But now we got three kids that's been graduated from college. That just took our whole legacy up a notch. So when I see my grandson, I already know what my grandson is going to get. He's going to get something good because somebody made one decision about one thing in one generation, and now you're seeing it manifest in all these other generation so all of that has to do with self-improvement you can change in an instant and that's in the bible you can change in an instant you can go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning and do like we used to do when we were kids we would pretend like when i was a kid we pretend oh i'm on this i'm gonna be that and in your mind what would you do you would start acting the way that you thought whatever you were pretending to be would be i'm gonna be a basketball player i'm gonna be but when we get to be an adult, that's what this book is talking about. We stop pretending because somebody told you, grow up, stop doing it, forget that decision, don't even think about it, you too old, you too this, you too that. And then what we say is, I guess you're right. Instead of saying, no, nah, you ain't right, you wrong, because I'm going this way, and I'm going to be this. But you got to control your mind. So um, that's the long answer to self-improvement. And, the, and the, the fourth thing I would say is, you know, you got to commit. You, you have, I mean, read your Bible every day, whatever verse it is. You don't have to be a minister or what have you. But pick you out a section, read that every day. Come back, get into that forgiveness mode, forgive yourself, 
and get everybody else that you're holding on to, get that off of you. Next day, you move into that visualization. Start dreaming again. Start thinking about all the cars and houses or whatever you want to do, all the people you want to help. Because you can't be a blessing to somebody if in your mind you're already still in bondage yourself. And that's self-inflicted. And then the fourth thing is you got to commit. Because once you commit to being self-improved, I look at God. Look at Dwayne Johnson. Dwayne Johnson only a few years younger than me. That joker always looks swollen up. I said, I'm about to do that. You know, they must. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, but we can do it. But most people his age don't even think like that. But that, that man is in shape. He is in shape. So, my producer. Another question. Okay. What about on a financial level? Uh -huh. um, what, what, what takes classes, seminars? How would you single mindedly um, concentrate on on building your finance, my, your financial freedom? Financial. So freedom. I know there's a lot of books that there's a lot of books that you you, uh, you promote on on your show, uh -huh. and that I've been reading like the Ten X and uh, other books like that. Mm -hmm. But however, what about how how would one go find classes or seminars or articles to read? So I, and that's it. I'm gonna hang up. But those, those, those uh, <laughs> that, that's what I was thinking. Okay. So it is is a short answer to that. Um, financial freedom. And this is just my personal opinion. So let me let me preface that and say that this is my personal opinion about financial freedom. First thing is self improvement. So all of the stuff that I just shared with you. And the reason I, I believe in self-improvement first when you start talking about financial freedom is this. Being broke, when you, when you talk about being broke, being broke is a mindset. Being broke is tolerating mediocrity. That's, what, that's being broke. Like, I don't have no money. So now you're expecting the lights to be cut off at some point or repo to come through at some point a bankruptcy at some point because I'm broke. And I'm broke means that I'm broke here. It don't have nothing to do with how much money is in your account or how much Three debt, years. right? Yeah. Broke is, is a mindset, I'm broke. So when you start saying, well, what type of classes can you look, the first thing that you have to do is realize that you have a broke mentality and say, I wanna change. So you pivot and go into the self-improvement but specifically, when you start talking about what kind of books or audio tapes or things that you can, you know, start to study, I would say go back and study. The first couple of books that I would think about is like, you know, my competitors, the, the people that I consider my competitors. Dave Ramsey has a great, he has a great program, Financial Peace University. He has a lot of programs, a lot of tools online, a lot of things that you can do. If you feel like Dave Ramsey is going to help you. By all means, go to Dave Ramsey and check Dave Ramsey out. Um, Susie Orman, she has some stuff. She talks a lot about, you know, investing and coming from that space. So I would recommend her. Um, David Bach. David Bach has some great stuff. The Automatic Millionaire. You can get on and, and he talks about, you know, ways that you could, you know, set things up so they automate it. And then you have, you know, people like, Kelvin Boston. Kelvin Boston is when you move into the African American space. Kelvin Boston, you know, has some great books on personal finance. Uh, Michelle Singletary. Michelle Singletary, African American author that talks about, you know, personal finance and managing money and things of that nature. So you can get into that space. But what I, what I would also recommend is, you know, in the future, in the very very near future, that's that's the next step for the Daily Bread Radio Show is. We're going to start doing, you know, live seminars in Atlanta because I used to, I, and it goes into, you have to invest in yourself. 
So if you say you want to improve your personal finance or if you want to improve your self-worth, you got to invest. I mean, it's just no way around it. You go out. Some people say, well, I don't have money. But I'm like, look, it's Memorial Weekend. Somebody going to have a cookout. Somebody going to buy drinks. Somebody going to buy an outfit. Somebody going to buy clothes. People graduate. We're going to have a graduation party. But you got to invest in yourself. So I would say pay the money to go to these seminars. Because when I go to seminar, I might pay 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. But what I'm thinking about is this. Not only am I going to get this money back because I'm going to learn a technique. You can go to a seminar. You only need to learn one technique. And like I just talked about, that one decision, that one technique that you learn for, say it costs you $500. You, you're going to spend $500 on some stuff that you ain't going to never get no money back out of it. You know, and, and I'll give you a quick one right off the rip. Average cable bill, $120 a month. Five months, $600. 12 months, $2,400. 10 years, $24,000. So you're gonna spend $24,000 on some TV, spend $500, invest in yourself, learn something from a financial standpoint that can not only change your life, but change your children's children's life. So and we gotta get away from, again, the broke mentality, like I want free, I want, free is gone. I mean, free is gone, just like Les Brown said. You know, we buy what we want and we beg for the things that we need. So that's pretty powerful. And, and that's what my recommendation would be is to, you know, make sure you feed yourself. And if you can't go to a seminar, the quickest way that you can get your hands on something is go get a library card, which is free, and spend some time in the library. And you can look up all of these books in the library. They have audio tapes. They have CDs. And then you take those tapes and you put them in your car. Like you mentioned the 10X rule. 10X rule with Grant Car Cardone. I have a six CD changer in my car. I took the whole set, took all six of his CDs. It's a one box set, put all six of them in there. And as I'm driving around, he's just talking to me, educating me about different things. But that's better than me listening to Waka Flocka, or, you know, whatever the new, whatever, whatever, because I'm gonna just listen to it. Oh, that's good. But it's a time and a place for that. And it's, you know, people, you know, word, people with God, and what I envision for the Daily Bread is we're going to move, the, the next phase of this is moving into the church, because I haven't even started to hit all these churches and all of these, you know, other places of worship to let them know that the Daily Bread exists, and this is what we're doing, and we're doing something positive, and, and it's every time, I don't care what church you go to, I could be here, I could be in New York, I could be in Ohio, I'd have been in Florida, I'd have been in Texas, I'd have, wherever I go to church. When that minister says you're going to have a financial breakthrough, they're going crazy. So what that says to me is we got a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of people that need to be, you know, uh, tuned into our ministry here on the Daily Bread Radio Show. But some great questions tonight. Great questions. So we got about two minutes left in the show. And first of all, I want to thank everybody. I mean, the Facebook is, I mean, it's just out of control. I see, you know, Brian Armstrong, he's seeing you now, but that's my little brother, Andre. Um, I see Skilly. You know, I, I see Michelle Mitchell. And um, I like I always say, Cynthia, Cynthia Owens is on here. And this young lady, I mean, I'm at a, a very, you know, blessed level. I guess that's the best way to put it as far as my career goes. But this young lady, 20 plus years ago, when I just, I was green, and I'm just learning my way, doing my thing. She poured into me, really supported me. And, and that's what I always talk to you all about, relationships. Make sure your relationships are good so that way 20 years down the line, when you are doing something, somebody won't be you know, hanging on to that, that negative word that you had. But this young lady, I want to say thank you to her because she really steered me in the right direction and really got me on the path of being an awesome leader in healthcare and told me exactly what I need to do. She was the first person told me I need to go and get a, my certification in case management because at the time I was just a registered nurse. And, and I promise you, you know, you have people like that that just sow into your life and you and, and, and mean you good. That's all they mean is good. So I really appreciate her and everything that she's done for me in my career, and, and, and she still supports me. So everybody that's on Facebook Live, everybody that's on the air, the thing that I'm going to charge you with, I need some help. I don't usually ask for things. But make sure you share this with people because, like I said, the next phase is now that I got all that other stuff off my plate, you know, 
kids are graduating from college. It's just me and my wife. We got ended. I got a bunch of time, and I'm grinding. I'm going to be grinding. So you'll be seeing a lot of me now, a lot more posted. I'm doing a lot of stuff you already put on YouTube and other areas. I said by September, October, I'm going to have my first seminar, first live seminar. So I'm already in, in talks about you know, where we're going to have it at and what it's going to look like. I'm going to bring in some experts, people who are in the tax you know, arena, people who are into investing, people who you know, into finance. So that way it ain't just me because I want you to hear from the experts and um, I want you to be able to you know, spread the word. Tell your church about it. Tell your, your pastor, your minister. Um, I'm well-spoken. I'll come and speak to any group, women's group, men's group, children's group. Um, I have my own book. We're going to write another book. Another thing that we're going to continue to, to promote is sponsorship because um, with the sponsorship, it, it helps both of us. It helps you. You may have a, you know, a business that you're doing, a business that you want to start, or something that you endeavor to do to get some additional exposure and just think about this microphone is on the internet it's uncensored we can use this platform so if you got a business or something that you want to promote it's 120 dollars um, for the sponsorship that'll take you for the balance that's like six months so it'll take you for the balance of the year and what we'll do is like each thursday i come on i can promote your business and you can write your own I maybe even be able to get you a jingle like mine like your daily bread but um, we definitely need the sponsorships. The other thing that's, that's really getting close is we're going to start a, a debt club because with the debt club, it's going to be similar to Weight Watchers where people come in and, and we just fully transparent. It's not here to judge or talk about, oh, oh my goodness, you got $300,000 worth of debt. Good, because when we finish with this program, you're going to be able to get up there and say, well, hey, I'm, I'm debt free. My mind is clear. I just wrote a book. Or I'm doing this. When we're going on a cruise. And that's what I see with this group. It's like we eliminate debt, we start investments, and we're doing things like going on cruises or going to Maui and, and doing this, the stuff that some of our counterparts and exposing our kids to that type of stuff, just a, a different type of living. So definitely wanted to um, you know encourage you to you know have people listen to the show. I'm solid now. I'm good for the summer. Maybe, maybe off one Thursday, if that, but I'm totally committed to helping anybody that needs to be helped. Um, if you want to reach me, you can reach me via email, Daily Bread Radio Show at yahoo.com. That's the Daily Bread Radio Show at yahoo.com. If you want to uh, reach me on Twitter, it's Joaquin Thompson Sr. at Daily Bread Radio. Joaquin Thompson Sr. at Daily Bread Radio. And um, my, I'm, I'm totally committed that you're going to see, not, now you're going to see what a grind looks like because you're going to be like, oh my goodness, he, he, he's doing it all because uh, there ain't no rest. It ain't no rest. So I appreciate all of you all. Why don't I see you just join? I love you, your husband, everybody that's on the show. Antonio, Miss, hey, I got to get you back on, Tony. I see my brother-in-law, Kevin. I love you, uh, Michelle, everybody. I appreciate all of the support. And what we're going to do, I'm going out. I'm going to play the jingle first because I'm so proud about my jingle. I got my own jingle. And uh, after we do the jingle, we're going to go in and close the show out. Commodores with Jesus' is love. You know. So that's it for the show this week. Next week we'll be back on 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. DKMRadio.com. Y'all have a beautiful evening. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's sweet. Hey, bro, you want to old school.